from Jeff Dice at the Mises Institute. Seattle's Chaz, homesteaders or illegal squatters. And this is a really cool article. I love how Jeff analyzes this. And I've I've never been so excited to get these ideas from someone who's who's fundamentally disagreeing with me on the issue. And it's because we are so close. Like if there's a dividing line on this issue, it's like he's barely on one side and I'm barely on the other side. And there are 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 people like you know on so much further apart on both sides of this whereas i see this as still a fundamentally beautiful thing in line with jefferson's quote that the value of keeping the spirit of resistance is alive that uh, or alive is, is so high that you have to celebrate it and make sure that it doesn't die so that even if it's done wrong more often than right and he's saying, you know, it's sort of like I, I'd rather attend the uh, problems of, of too much freedom than too little. So to Jeff and his analysis here. Protesters in Seattle have taken over whole city blocks in a neighborhood known as Capitol Hill, just a bit north of downtown. They occupy city streets and parks as well as apparently a police precinct building. Now, uh, about the occupation, as far as I know, the precinct building is is like locked and closed and just abandoned not that they're they're really occupying it but they're kind of like but that's great right this enclave dubbed the capitol hill autonomous zone or Chaz, is now making headlines around the world it's newly assembled residents have declared Chaz an independent nation apart from both seattle and america and thus exempt from laws and local police jurisdiction they have set up fences and checkpoints around the area so much for open borders now uh, again uh, you know here i think I, when i first started reading, I was like jeff are, are you showing some bias here in the inaccuracies that you're including in the story? Because, yeah, they, they set up uh, fences and, and, and checkpoints, but they are actually relatively open borders. As far as I, from all the accounts that I've been reading, like they're, they're just keeping out cops and government officials. People are, and, and of course, if you're undercover, this place got to be riddled with undercover cops right now. You know, have a little sympathy for that, please, Jeff. But now, people were able to come and go freely, you know, more than when the police were there, you know, managing the protest with uh, tear gas and rubber bullets. And already urban legends are proliferating about warlords taking over extortion and shakedowns, replacing taxes and new forms of quasi private security taking hold. Yeah. So that, now some of this you go, well, urban legends. Well, you're citing urban legends. Why are you? Yeah, now it's funny because. Jeff comes out it's seemingly really against this before giving a more reasoned consideration and then coming out against this. But nobody knows how long the situation will persist, but recall how 2011's Occupy Wall Street demonstrations lasted many months. Of course, Capitol Hill, like all urban neighborhoods, is a mix of public and private property. Ingress and egress for residents and businesses takes place via public streets, which are severely impaired at the moment. Property values the viability of retail stores and the general quietude and livability of this gentrified neighborhood are very much in flux. Now, again, uh, impaired at the moment, maybe they're getting more traffic generally and uh, because of the attention. But um, are, are the, is it impaired more than when there were cops there again? You know, is, is it more impaired than how it was before all the protests? Oh, yeah, for sure. Property values, the viability of retail stores and the general quietude and livability of this gentrified neighborhood are very much in flux. Anyone who owns a condo, shop, or restaurant in the area has a right to be angry in an argument for monetary compensation from both the protesters themselves and the city government that has so badly failed them. Now, if the protesters didn't violate the property rights, and you know, you have a claim for monetary compensation, you own a restaurant. If I have an angry protest on a public street in front of your restaurant and it drives away your business, you don't have a right to, to sue me for that. If I put up a bad review and just call out your, your restaurant for having crappy food, you don't get to sue me for that, right? So uh, now, do they get to sue the government that failed them? So this, I'm, I think Jeff gets this point totally wrong. And that you have, you have a right to be angry um you have an argument okay so jeff says you have an argument i'll give him that you have an argument for the city government that has so badly failed them yeah the supreme court decided jeff knows this right the supreme court decided a long time ago that 
police governments have no obligation to defend you. So as Jeff says, good luck with that in a Seattle courtroom. Yeah, exactly. What about the purely public, i.e. government-owned land and buildings around Capitol Hill? To the extent that the occupied buildings and streets belong to the city of Seattle, are the protesters legitimately occupying them? And this is the great question where I, I think it's very appropriate for Jeff to give them the benefit of the doubt. Can anyone, Seattleite or not, make a valid claim to such property? Are they illegal squatters or legitimate homesteaders? <clears throat> now, I think, that Jeff, that's an unnecessarily binary question. Because, you know, is it because are they illegal squatters? You would be an illegal squatter, right, if you went and started living or doing stuff or occupying private property that people didn't want you on. You're not an illegal squatter if you do it on unclaimed land or you do it on illegitimately claimed land, right, as government claimed land or on land that you have a partial claim to. Right. So if a group of citizens say, hey, we're separating from this government system and we're taking our share or you know, some proxy of it or just what's immediately practical, we're taking our share. We're taking a share of it with us. You know, we're taxpayers. We're Seattle residents. And this is you know, why Jeff, I believe, uh, uses the term Seattleite or not. You know, if you're a Seattle City taxpayer, do you do you have more of a claim to that property? Yeah. You know, in some you know, general abstract sense but are they legitimate homesteaders well it's not really a legitimate homesteading unless it's unclaimed or abandoned property now this is great because this gets to the next part where jeff is quoting one of my favorite authors walter block so the next paragraph of jeff writing is it seems like an absurd question on its face and it is surely the forceful takeover of a long established area cannot be legitimate even if a few government owned roads and buildings make up the Prince or muck up the principles involved, but no less than Professor Walter Block likens government owned property to virgin territory, albeit stolen, available to any claimant for homesteading. In Block's conception, anything owned by the city of Seattle, libraries, building, equipment, roads, you name it, as, is as wide open to anyone as a virgin tract of land in deepest Alaska, never touched by humans. Quote, I do not at all claim that property such as government roads or libraries is unowned. Rather, I claim these holdings were stolen. I guarantee, excuse me, I agree that the state now possesses them. I argue only that this is unjustified. And yes, I insist the same libertarian analysis can be applied in this concept of context to virgin and stolen land. Why? This is because for the libertarian, at least as I can screw them, stolen land is the jury virgin land ready for the next homesteader to seize it on the assumption that the rightful owner cannot be located or acquiesces in the state's seizure or that arguendo we can ignore this rightful owner. Now, one place I would I I, I would tweak Walter's statement, and I say that uh, as a man for whom I have great intellectual respect with, with some hesitation here, that the uh, you cannot ignore the rightful owner uh, in in a case of a state seizure like this, you know, if the state, if, if if government steals land, you know, like from the Native Americans, right, and and kicks people off land, and it's been abandoned, and the people who were there, them, their dad, all their ancestors are dead. Anybody with any illegitimate, any concept of a legitimate claim to it is dead, and this is the government saying they own it. The government owns it. Yes, then you can ignore any potential rightful owner because they don't exist. But in this case, there's at least some kind of, uh, you know, claim for taxpayers, for people who haven't been, you know, have had it stolen from them and their implications to reclaiming its use. So I think it's a little more nuanced than that. Seattle's mayor, Jenny Durkin, may not go quite as far as Dr. Block, but she does appear to acknowledge, because of course she wouldn't say it's stolen, uh, but she does appear to acknowledge the new uh, community essentially colonizing major thoroughfares in the Emerald City. She may not be ready to grant the Chaz outright ownership of the streets in question, but neither is she setting any deadlines for eviction. Quote, uh, Mayor Jenny Durkin from Twitter, I remain committed to working with community, including the organizers currently in Capitol to reimagine how we do things in the city and what investments in public health, safety, and economic justice look like. I'm working with Seattle PD Chief Carmen Best and listening to community to understand how we can continue to build trust between our Seattle police officers and the community around the East Precinct. Clearly, the mayor is in the midst of a dangerous situation, both literally for the people in the Chaz and in terms of her own political career. 
It's a public relations nightmare from a purely legal perspective what grants are authority over who occupies Capitol Hill. One answer is taxes, says Dr. Hans Hermann Hoppe. In his view, the streets of Seattle are not virgin territory available to homesteaders, but rather akin to land held in trust by admittedly unworthy state agents on behalf of taxpayers. If those trustees won't sell the land or other property outright and return the funds to taxpayers, Hoppe's view is that they at least ought to operate and maintain such property on their behalf. So the pur for the purpose of countering Dr. Block's contention that government property should be viewed as open to homesteading, and only for that purpose, Hoppe says, public property should be viewed as being owned by the taxpayers. As such, it should be managed on behalf of the long-suffering net taxpaying citizens as a matter of simple justice. And yeah, absolutely. Why, like, yeah, why not? The only caveat here is that in, in you know going to Block's position is when there is no legitimate public usage that the taxpayers have any claim to. It's just land the government stole and it's just sitting on and sequestering, right? Now, with Chaz, neither of these perspectives answer the question. I think you need my taking parts of both to really understand what's going on with Chaz and come to a decision on whether their claim is legitimate or not, or rather to what degree it is legitimate. Principles aside, the essence of ownership is control. Bureaucrats, police, and politicians who control access to and use of public property are its de facto owners because only they can sell, encumber, or control its use. The average American's ownership claim to the local playground or city library is virtually nil. Simply try sleeping in them overnight and you'll quickly find out who really owns them. So for the moment, the Seattle protesters have the greatest control over Capitol Hill and hence an ownership claim of sorts under the brute force of possession is nine-tenths of the law. Whether their claim is valid comes down to whether they are illegal squatters or righteous Lockean homesteaders. Again, no, this is, I, I have to agree with, I, I mean, I have to disagree with, with, with Jeff here. And, and Jeff, I gotta say, I would, I would love to have you on my show. Let's set this up. Let's, let's do an interview and, and see if, if we can come to a, a perhaps more nuanced understanding for both of us here or either of us. But you, you, you set up this bi binary proposition, either they're illegal squatters or righteous homesteaders. What if they're taxpayers claiming back their share? That would satisfy both the Lockean and, excuse me, both the Hoppian and the Blockian criteria here. Gosh, that's got to be music to some really enthusiastic intellectual libertarian ears. We have thus satisfied both the Blockian and the Hoppian criteria with this analysis that shows the Chaz protesters, if only in their claiming of government property for an autonomous zone, are legitimate in doing so. In a densely settled area like Seattle with a long history of property titles flowing from valid sales, the question becomes absurd. Their protests and encampments directly affect the undisputed private property all around them. Now, see, this is, again, I got to disagree with Jeff. Affecting private property is not the same as violating private property. Now, to the extent that they're forcing a private property owner to be now a part of Chaz and not giving them the option to defect back to the United States, yeah, that, that's a violation of private property. I would not be supporting that. Um, no, certainly not. Uh, but who says they're denying that? Have any property owners said, you know, we don't want to be part of this? We, you know, if they do, and, and there's some denial of, of, of a private property owner bringing in representatives of the U.S. government or police, Yes, you know, there are certainly other, lots of other things that, as the SJWs would say, problematic about that, even for a libertarian. The Seattle government has thoroughly controlled the roads and police using funds forcibly taxed from Seattle residents, Capitol Hill residents, businesses, and visitors rely and depend on existing understandings and contractual arrangements. Seattle cannot be homesteaded, not even city property, in any conceivable manner that is justice to its current inhabitants. And to the extent that they've paid for it all through taxes, their right to evict the Chaz protesters clearly supersedes any right to conflate occupation with protest. So this is where, again, like I'm barely on the side of supporting this, where if, if, if I take the Hopian analysis and say that this is justified because as taxpayers, the protesters in Chaz have a claim to say, you know what, we're taking, we're leaving and we're taking our share of what we paid for as taxpayers. 
then their process is not legitimate. And it's, it shouldn't be born out of protest and conflict, but rather out of uh, a more peaceful process where they say, hey, guys, we're petitioning for our share. If you won't give it to us, you know, then, then we'll take it. I mean, that's that that would be better, like kind of how the American Revolution worked with a you know, petition of, uh, for a redress of grievances before forceful rebellion. So do they have a right to, to evict them? Yeah, I don't see that I think is an appropriate property rights analysis. But if you want to go that way with it, Jeff, you also have to respect that the property uh, claim by the taxpayers as a whole also applies to the subset of the protesters who's saying, we want our share, we want to be out of the system. It's tempting to dismiss the Seattle protesters en masse because of their terrible and violent political beliefs and their terrible designs for remaking America without property or markets. Yeah, there's a lot of that. But, you know, is that all of them? Would you condemn people doing a good thing because some of them have bad ideas. I don't think that's really fair either. Again, if we don't hang together, we will all hang separately. I think it's very important to remember here. Um, but that doesn't change the thorny question of how to deal with them here now. If they are illegal squatters, not to mention disruptors of many who live or work in the area, then their forcible removal is justified. But New York City lacked the political will to remove Occupy Wall Street campers from Sakati Park for many months. Will ultra-woke Seattle in 2020 with its obliging mayor evict the Chaz protesters anytime soon? <clears throat> I, I don't think so. This is going to be here for a while. It's nice to see this kind of play out. And I doubt it's going to play out the way that Jeff and I, I think, would like to see it play out as a property rights negotiation between the protesters and the city of Seattle. Uh, negotiate on behalf of the rest of the taxpaying public of the city of Seattle. But this is still a, a an exciting assertion of sovereignty that even if it has elements, so, you know, there are elements that are illegitimate. If they just said, hey, we're taking the six block area, then there's private property in here. And the private property owners didn't have the option in the process to say, yeah, no, we're going to stick with the USA then yeah, that's illegitimate. But if the claiming of the government property, the roads and the parks and things like that, and government buildings, uh, that is legitimate because they are taxpayers with a claim to it as much as anybody else. And they're saying, we're suggesting a different use of these government resources. We hope that this is respected and this is how we're going to assert this, uh, this control, this property right, which is Jeff, which is Jeff correctly points out really is the essence of, of ownership. So, uh, you know, we're going to keep looking at these issues one way or another. As a libertarian, there's even if you disagree with it, even if you're just barely on the other side of the line as Jeff is here, you should be celebrating this and saying, yeah, it's it, as Thomas Jefferson said, it might be done wrong, but it still needs to be ce celebrated to keep the spirit of rebellion and resistance alive. And there's no more American way to do that than by declaring your independence as they have at least to one degree or another, with the Chaz in Seattle.